There are many shapes and sizes of distribution of values. One of the most useful ones in an introductory quantitative methods class is the normal distribution, which is also known as the Gaussian distribution. It's good to know that the normal distribution is a theoretical distribution, and as such, no distribution of values fits it perfectly. But a lot of distributions are actually very similar to the theoretical normal distribution, so we can use it as a really good substitute. For those of you who are curious, here's the equation that gives us the normal distribution curve. This stems from mathematics that are well beyond the scope of this class, but notice that in the equation we have the presence of the mean and of the standard deviation. These two elements influence the shape and position of any normally distributed variable. If we take a look at this example, both normal distributions have the same mean, but curve 1 has a lower standard deviation than curve 2. Notice how curve 2 is more spread out and isn't as high as curve 1. Standard deviation influences the shape of the curve, not its position. Now here, these two curves have identical standard deviations, but their means are different. They have the same shape, so the mean influences only the position of the distribution. And these two curves have different means and different standard deviations. As such, both their positions along the x-axis and their shapes are quite different. Even though normal distributions can have different shapes and positions, there are three constant properties that apply to each and every one of them. The first one is that a normal distribution is bell-shaped, with the two tails continuing indefinitely in both directions, never touching the x-axis. The second property is that the normal curve is a unimodal distribution that is symmetric about the center where the mean, mode, and median are equal. And the third, maybe even more importantly, is that the total area under the normal distribution curve is equal to 1 or 100%. So all of this dark blue shaded area is equal to 1. Remember that this curve stems from a rather cumbersome looking equation. Using math, we could actually prove this property. From this last property, we can develop the empirical rule further. Remember that this rule states that 68% of the values for normally distributed variable are found within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% of values within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of values within three standard deviations. We can go further with these percentages. Up to one standard deviation, there are 34% of values on each side of the mean. Between one and two standard deviations on each side of the mean again, there are 13.5% of the values, and between two and three standard deviations on each side of the mean, there are 2.35% of the values. So there is a little 0.15% higher than three standard deviations on each side of the mean as well. We can use these percentages as probabilities. Let's do an example. You get your coffee at the local coffee shop, which roasts the beans in situ. The roasting time affects the amount of caffeine your coffee will have, and slight variations in caffeine do occur. The mean caffeine content of your regular coffee is of 60 mg, with a standard deviation of 0.5 mg. Based on the empirical rule, you have a 50% probability of getting a coffee with a caffeine content of 60 mg and higher, a 2.5% chance of getting coffee with a caffeine content higher than 62 mg, a 3.5% probability of getting a coffee with a caffeine content between 58 and 59 mg, and we could go on forever and ever. But what about a probability of getting a caffeine content of 57.35 mg, or any other caffeine content that is not a whole number of standard deviations away from the mean? That's where the standard normal distribution comes in. Because each normally distributed variable has its own mean and standard deviation, there are as many normal distributions as there are combinations of mean and standard deviations, which is a lot.
When trying to determine areas under the curve, or probabilities, you'd have to have one table of area values for each variable. This isn't very practical, of course, and having one distribution of reference would help us easily determine percentages for specific values. Statisticians have devised the standard normal distribution, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. The percentages remain the same as all other normal distributions. We've heard the term standard before with the z-scores. Actually, when you calculate all the z-scores for a given normal distribution, you are transforming it into the standard normal distribution. Here's a reminder on how to calculate the z-score. Again, you have the z-score, which is symbolized by z. You have x, the value you wish to find the z-score for, to which you subtract the sample mean, and you divide the result by the sample standard deviation. Remember, you can calculate z-scores for a population as well. Just make sure you use the appropriate equation. This is all fine and dandy, but how do we find areas associated to specific values under the standard normal distribution curve? We must go through these three steps. Step one is to sketch and label the normal curve shading the desired area. Step two, look up the cumulative area in the appropriate table. And step three, if necessary, perform the appropriate operation to obtain the desired area. Of course, we will do a few examples. But before we do these examples, let's take a look at the table of cumulative areas. At first glance, this looks like an undecipherable jumble of numbers. Don't despair, and let's take a few seconds to figure this out. This picture here shows you what the values in the table represent. It indicates that the values represent the area to the left of a given z-score, or the area beneath the curve to the left of a given z-score. The table shows us two types of information, the areas here in the blue rectangle and the z-scores in the two red rectangles. The z-scores are divided in two, the column being the whole value and the first decimal place, while the row is your z-score's second decimal place. Each area value has its unique combination of z-score value. For example, this area value of 0.9582, which stands for 95.82%, is in the 1.7 column and the 0 0.03 row, meaning that it is the area to the left of the z-score 1.73. We can invert this process. Say we have a z-score of 0.91. First we find 0.9 and then we find 0.01. You'll find the area to the left of this z-score where the row and column intersect, like this. The table reveals that the area to the left of the z-score 0.91 is of 81.86%. You might have noticed that the table only has the positive z-scores. Because of the sheer size of the table, it was necessary to split it in two parts. Here is the negative z-score table. To find area values of z-scores in this table, you proceed in exactly the same way. Now, we will go on and do examples in the following video.